All right, here in Psalm 19, the, the subject matter that I'm going to be preaching on this evening is called Secret Sins. And um, if you look down in Psalm 19, where we just read, where we just started, we're going to start, we're going to read over again right here in verse number 7. The Bible reads, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So here we see, and I love this because people these days don't want to look at God's law. They don't want to look at the law of the Lord. They say in the New Testament, you know, oh, it's all grace. And hey, amen and praise the Lord for the grace of God. Praise God for the free gift that he's given to us. But the law, the Bible says right here that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. God's law is perfect. There's nothing wrong with God's law. These days, people want to look at God's law and judge God's law as being inferior or invalid. People don't like to hear the fact that the Bible says, for example, just one example, this Leviticus 20, 13, in these days, is people look at God's law as something that's reprehensible. Because God's law says that if man shall lie with mankind as he lies with, with, with the woman, they too shall be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. That's God's law. God's law was ordained to say, hey, this is wickedness, this is a sin, and this is so bad, it deserves a death penalty. People today, even Christians, when I say something like that, when I say, yes, I believe that God's law is righteous, that that ought to be the law of the land, because when God made these laws, I mean, just like every other law, adultery, fornication, like any, any law that God has made a law against, I believe is righteous, and we ought to have these types of laws. Yet Christians today will even look at that and say, oh, no, we can't do that. What are you talking about? We're in the New Testament. That's your, look, I get it. We're not saved by the law. We know that. We're saved through God's grace. However, God's law is perfect. It says here, is perfect converting the soul. Why does it convert the soul? Because the law teaches us that we're sinners. The law teaches us that, hey, we've all broken God's law. We need redemption. We need a Savior. And that's why the law of the Lord is perfect. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 8 of Psalm 19. The statutes of the Lord are right. So here's, we're saying the same thing. Look, God's laws, His statutes are right. They're righteous. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. God's laws, His statutes, we ought to have respect for them and we ought to want to learn them and know them in order to change our own lives and to live a better, more enlightening and a more joyful life knowing what God's will is and going, knowing what God's judgments are. That is something that we ought to, to embrace and something that we ought to love and not shy away from and be like, just because you may be guilty of doing a certain sin, don't have this stiff-necked attitude that says, oh, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing, and, and, just, and just turn your back on it instead of just embracing it and say, you know what? And that's why I started off this sermon praying that we'd all have meek, humble hearts to be able to accept, hey, when we've done something wrong, if we can see it flat out in the Bible, like God's law says this, then we ought to be able to say, you know what? I've done wrong. Confess that sin, forsake that sin, embrace God's law and say, you know what? I know that God loves us. He loves us so much. He gave his only begotten son. If he loves us that much, do you think he has his laws here to harm us or to keep us from having pleasure or enjoyment on this earth? No, it's for our benefit. He's looking out for us. He's saying, look, I don't want you to do these things because it's only going to bring sorrow and sadness and destruction. And it's going to ruin your life if you get into any of these things that I've made laws against. He knows us. He made us. He created us the way that we are. And he knows that these things, if we get into them, are going to be destructive for us. So he's given us these boundaries the same way that a parent does with their children. The same reason I would tell my children if they're standing up on the back of a chair and rocking back, I say, hey, don't do that. You know, Stop doing that because I know you're going to fall and it's going to hurt you really bad. You might think it's real fun for the moment. But in a minute, you're going to see that it's not, it's not as fun as you think it is. And that's a, that's a real simple analogy to the way you know, our sins are. Oftentimes we might think, oh yeah, I just want to go get a drink. It's so much fun. I, you know, I like getting a buzz or I like to do this or that. You know, whatever it may be. Oh, I like you know, having this relationship with this woman that's not my wife. Look, you may think it's fun for a second, but it's going to bring destruction in the end. And God gives us these laws for a reason, to, to, because he's looking out for us. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 9, the Bible says, The fear of the Lord is clean, 
It's a good thing. We ought to have the proper fear of God. Enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Not enough good things to be stated in these three verses that we just read about God's law, about how good it is, about how righteous it is, about how much we ought to love God's law. Verse 10 says, More to be desired are they than gold. Knowing God's word, knowing God's laws, embracing God's laws. Hey, that's better than just having a bunch of financial, just having a bunch of money, a pile of money. If you had a choice here between God's law and just a whole bunch of money, we ought to be cleaving to God's law. Now, of course, it's easy to say something like that, but it's another thing to do it. But this is what he's saying to us. He says, look, God's law and knowing that and having that knowledge and having that wisdom is way better than being rich. It's way better than having a whole pile of gold. The reason why I'm starting off with this before I even get into the main message of the sermon is to just point out how our attitudes ought to be towards God's laws. How we ought to be able to embrace that and accept that and, and, and really treat the Word of God and God's laws as better than gold. That this is where truth is. This is life resides in God's words. We ought to be able to cleave to that. The Bible says in Romans 12 verse 9, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Now that word abhor is a strong word for hatred. It's a very strong hatred. He's saying, look, you need to abhor that which is evil. Hate it so much that you are going to stay far, far, far away from doing evil things. And he says, cleave to that which is good. Cling on to it real tight. Grab on to it as if your life depended on it. This is what we see in God's law. This is the attitude that we ought to have. Unfortunately, too many people are relaxed about it. They'll, 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 they're okay with God's word at a distance. They're not cleaving to it. They're saying, okay, you know, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus, but I don't really want to get fanatical about it. I don't want to, you know, I don't really, I don't know if I believe all of it. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there. Look, you ought to believe all of it. It's God's word. God's holy word. It's all truth. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, the Bible says. We ought to be holding on as tight as possible to God's word and getting in as much as possible. Get in depth, read the Bible, and, and, and get in really as close as possible to God's word. Now, the Bible says here, you know, also then to, to, to abhor that which is evil, we need to have the proper hatred of sin. And this is going to be an important thing to keep in mind as I get into the bulk of the sermon tonight. Abhorring that which is evil. We need to hate it. Because what am I preaching on? I'm going to be preaching on secret sins. Secret sins are sins that we have that maybe nobody else knows about. These are the things that are the easiest to let continue in your life. It's harder to continue doing a sin that's out in the open. It's harder when you're accountable for certain things. It's harder to continue doing that stuff because you got other eyes on you and you, and you are concerned maybe about what other people are thinking or whatever. But the secret sins, the ones that happen either in your mind or the ones that you can get away with or you think you could get away with, and no one's going to know about it. Those are the sins that tend to fester. Those are the sins that are going to destroy you because they're going to spiral out of control. As with every sin, the longer you think you can continue to do it, I'm just going to dabble and sin a little bit. I'm just going to do this this one time. Oh, I'm just, I'm just going to get started in this. Sin will always drag you down further than you ever wanted to go. Oh, as soon as you open up that door crack, Satan's going to kick it wide open and say, here I am, and, and you're going to get a lot more than you bargained for. And it happens every single time with sin. But let's keep reading, because this, this chapter here in Psalm, Psalm 19 goes into the secret sins. So verse 11, we're continuing on here. It says, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. We're warned through God's laws, through his statutes, through his testimonies. It's a warning. And in keeping of them, there is great reward. So God says, hey, it's, it's a good benefit to you reap a great reward by obeying my commandments, by just ad adhering to my laws and doing what's right. Hey, you are going to receive a great reward from that. Verse 12, who can understand his errors? And it's such a deep verse because the more I read the Bible, the more you start to understand there's probably a lot more things that you do 
throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month that are sinful than you even thought or that you realized before. And, and when you really start getting an intimate knowledge of the Bible and just and you're reading through and reading through it, you start to think, well, wait a minute, if this is wrong, then you start to make those applications, right? Because not everything in the Bible spells out specifically. You know, I did a sermon uh, last week on gambling, right? So the, the Bible doesn't say, you know, thou shalt not gamble. It doesn't say anything about a casino, right? But what we have to do is take biblical principles and look throughout the Bible. Look at these different scriptures that say, you know, he that desireth, he that hasteth to be rich shall become poor, you know, and, and the love of money is the root of all evil. And we start making these applications and say, well, wait, look, if I'm, if I'm trying to get rich real fast, is that right? What does the Bible say about that? And make these applications to these other events or the other, other choices that we can make in our life. Now, the more you see and understand the Bible, the more you're going to start to put it together for your own life and say, oh yeah, okay, well wait a minute, maybe I shouldn't be doing this, maybe I shouldn't be doing that. He says here in verse 12, he says, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Now when he says secret faults there, I believe he's referring to sins that he himself doesn't know is a sin. So he's asking God, he's praying to God, you know, God, who can even understand all of their problems, all of their sins, everything that I do wrong? He's like, he's like, cleanse me from my secret sins, the ones that I don't even know that I'm doing, that I'm ignorantly committing against you, Lord God. Cleanse me from those. I don't want to be in sin. I don't want to be doing something that this is displeasing to you. Even if I don't realize it right now, God, show me my sins. Show me my iniquities so that I could get them right and get right with you. But... Um, and that's why I believe he's meaning here by secret faults. But what I'm preaching about more tonight is what he goes into in verse 13, which is the presumptuous sins, where we make presumptions and act upon it, where we're presumptuously doing something. We know it's wrong and we do it anyways. And those are the ones where when I'm talking about secret sins that we're keeping a secret, we're keeping it to ourselves. So in verse 13, the Bible says, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me because that's what happens. Sin will bring you into bondage and it's going to have dominion over you. It's going to start ruling your life and you're going to want to get away from it and it's going to have you, have you in a chokehold. It's going it's to bring you under bondage. And especially when you disregard God's law, when you have the audacity to say, you know what, I know this is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyways. That comes from a lust or great desire in your flesh to want to fulfill that sin so much that you're willing to ignore God's, God's commands. And he says that, the presumptuous sin, let that not have dominion over me because that's exactly what the end of that will be. When you have that strong of a desire, that strong of a will to do some kind of a sin, and I don't care what it is, Everybody struggles with their own sins in particular. People struggle with addictions, various kinds of addictions. It could be alcohol, it could be drugs, it could be pornography, it can be you know, gambling, it could be, you name it, fornication. It could be all kinds of different things that the Bible lays out is saying this is wrong, this is wicked, yet, yet people are driven to do these things and it, it gains dominion over them, especially when they know that it's wrong that they're doing and they continue to do it anyways. He says, let them not have dominion over me, then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. That last verse there, verse 14, is one that I would recommend memorizing in order to help you overcome whatever your secret sins are, whatever it is that might be going on in your head or might be going on in secret that no one else knows about. He says, look, let the words of my mouth, so the things that I speak and the meditation of my heart, basically what I'm thinking about, the things that I'm spending my time thinking about, let those things be acceptable in your sight, God. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Now turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. One of the easiest sins, I think, to commit for a man... And not just for men, I think you could also do it for a woman, but definitely for a man. Those secret sins are what happens when you look on another woman. 
No one knows what's going on in your mind or in your heart when you see a woman, walk, you know, and, you, and you're, you're laying your eyes upon them. But we're going to see what Jesus says about this, about, about doing something like that and looking on a woman inappropriately in your heart. And again, you can, you can do this all day and I would never know and someone else would never know because it's something that happens on the inside. But you know who knows? There is somebody that knows. God knows. God knows everything. God knows the thoughts and intents of your heart. God's the one that judges your heart. He knows these things and ultimately that's all that matters is what he thinks and what he knows. It doesn't matter what I think about you. It doesn't matter what someone else thinks about you. What matters is what God thinks about you. Unfortunately, too many people put too much emphasis on pleasing men and pleasing other people instead of pleasing God. That's what the Pharisees did. They wanted to look righteous in front of everybody else. They wanted everyone to give them the uppermost rooms at the feast and they would say these long prayers and they would make it sound like, oh yeah, they're so holy and they would pontificate to everybody else about what you ought to be doing and they wouldn't do any of it. They would say and not do. They were hypocrites and they were liars. That's not the way we need to be because they didn't care what God thought about them. They didn't care. They only cared about the people what the people thought about them, if they were held in high regard. And that's why when Jesus started to have people actually following him and listening to him and, and, and obeying him and, and being disciples of his, they got jealous. They got envious of him. And so much to the point they wanted him dead because he was actually draw, getting people to listen to him. And they wanted all the glory for themselves. They wanted people only listening to what they had to say and having that type of power. Look at Matthew 5, excuse me, verse number 27. Matthew 5, 27, Jesus Christ says this, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. These are strong words coming out of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in context here. You know, he starts off talking about it. When you look on a woman, he says, look, you know that it's wrong to commit adultery. That's in the law. That's in the Mosaic law. You know that. He's, I said, I'm going to go a step further. And this is what people don't they fail to realize about Jesus Christ and the law. He didn't come to destroy the law. He didn't come to abolish it. Yes, he brings grace. Yes, he brings salvation and redemption. Of course he does. But he didn't do away with the law. He says, look, you know that adultery is a sin, but you know what else? I'm telling you right now, if you even look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery in your heart with her. He's saying, don't even do that. Now, these are the types of sins that you need to look out for. And here's the reason why. One of the main reasons for looking out for it, obviously it's wrong anyway. I mean, Jesus Christ said, look, if you have a problem, if your right eye is offending you, he's like, pluck it out. It's better for you to lose an eye than to go to hell. He's saying it's way better for that. And this is, this is a pretty extreme thing to pluck out your own eyeball. That's strong language. That's the, he's trying to get his point across here. He's saying, look, don't be looking on women and lusting after them in your heart to commit adultery with them in your heart. But what happens is when you let your mind just wander, when you let your mind, when, 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 you, when you satisfy the lust of the eyes, and looking on things you ought not to be looking at and thinking things you ought not to be thinking about, it's going to lead to action. Eventually, that is what will happen. The more you indulge yourself and you could say, oh, well, I'm just going to look. Okay, well, I'm just going to look a little bit longer. Yeah, I'm going to look again. No. Now, you can't always control the things that come in front of your eyes, right? I mean, you're going out, you go to the store, you go shopping. Maybe something happens and some, some woman is dressed completely immodestly, you know, not the way they should be dressed at all. They're walking around like in their underwear or something or a bikini, and you, and you just happen to, 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 that means it comes into your view, right? There's nothing you can do about that, but you know what you can do? Don't look again. Man, don't take that second and third and fourth glance and don't be start staring at Oakland and just say, you know what? No, I'm not going to look at that. Because what happens? Because I know that if I just continue to stare upon something and, and look at that, 
then those thoughts are going to start to arise. Because your flesh is your flesh, it's going to drive you to think these things. So in order to prevent that, you need to be able to have that type of control to recognize right away, identify, whoa, I shouldn't be looking at that. Now that's an easy example with, with, you know, with, with the way men see a woman or something like that, but it can be anything. I mean, the long, if you just set something in front of your eyes, and, and this is known by the world. That's why they have the marketing the way they do. Right? There's, there's these, these rules and these laws. They say like someone has to see an advertisement like seven times before they'll act on it. And they have this all figured out down to a science. That's why people pay so much money to get their advertising on the Super Bowl. Right? They pay so much money because they know that when, when it's put in front of somebody's face, they're going to act on that and do something about it. So we need to be aware of this and know that whatever we're letting come in front of our eyes, Whatever we're setting there, it's going to end up, it could, it could very well end up in action. And the amount of money spent on advertising should be proof enough to let you know that. And Jesus is saying here, don't look on a woman to lust after in your heart. These are sins that, that are kept secret from people, but you need to watch out for them personally because even no matter how much you think you're getting away with it, you're not getting away with it because God can see what's going on. Now, a sin that I have, I don't even think I've preached on this since we've started the church, but it's very important, especially in the day that we live in with the internet, and that is the sin of, of looking at pornography, of looking at things that you ought not to be looking at, because this is something that's really easy to get caught up in. The internet's so wide open, and, and you can start off innocently, maybe, looking at certain videos, looking at politics, looking at news, and without fail, there's, these, there's always advertisements and other things going on and other videos that just... And, and what they do is they'll put up an image, even if it has nothing to do with the video, they'll put up an image because they know that scantily clad women will get a lot of people to click on it because they're like, animals is going, oh, I want to see this, right? I mean, this is that, that, that base reaction out of men that just say, oh, I want to look at this. And they know that. So, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into, I'm going to get into how to try to help avoid all this stuff in just a minute. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 101. Because that is a sin that people can do in secret from their little smartphone or from their computer or whatever. They get, get away for a while. They have time alone. And when they have this time alone, no one else knows what's going on. Right? And you could continue to do this thing and it's going to eat you up. And the sin of looking at that stuff, that is such a destructive sin to be a part of, to, to, to allow yourself to indulge in. When you start looking at things you shouldn't be looking at, especially you look at acts that are going on between, between people in, in that nature. And, and I'm trying not to be graphic. This is, you know, it's a, it's a family environment. I don't want to speak any words that are going to be. Um, you know, base words or things that are, that, are, that are not wholesome that my children ought not to hear, right? But I think everybody here could probably understand where I'm getting at with, with this stuff that, you're, that you allow to be put in front of your face. What you put into your mind, you can't just erase that stuff. It's not so simple to get it out. Once you view something, those images get like burned in your brain. If you know, I mean, if anyone knows what I'm talking about, you can see things and then later on it could still come back and come back and come back. So you need to be extremely careful with the things that you put in front of your face. Did I have you turn to Psalm 101? Yeah. Psalm 101, look at verse number two. Now I've often applied this to the television, just watching TV, because I, you know, if you're, if you're new year or whatever, I don't watch TV. I don't watch movies because I don't believe in the garbage that Hollywood's putting out. They're putting out just just a lot of sinful, <laughs> a lot of sinful stuff. That that's like, I mean, you're looking at adulterers and adulteresses, and it's being promoted, and and sinful actions are being portrayed in a positive light, or that's not that bad. So we don't watch any of that stuff because, and, and here in Psalm 101, verse two. The Bible says, I will behave myself in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. 
Again, within your own house, you, there's not very many eyes upon you, right? This is something that where you can get involved in a secret sin. But he's saying, no, in my house, I'm going to walk with a perfect heart, with an upright heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. We need to have, that's why I started off also mentioning Romans 12, 9. We need to have the proper hatred of sin. Because if you don't hate that sin, it's a lot easier to just allow, oh, well, maybe I'll look at it for, for just for a minute. I'll just look at it for a minute. No, if you have the proper hatred, you're going to be like, no, get away from me. I want nothing to do with you. He says, it shall not cleave to me because that's what it's going to do. When you put wicked things before your eyes, it's going to cleave to you. And it's going to bring you in bondage. You need to recognize it right up front and say, no, get away. I want nothing to do with that. I hate that. I hate that. I hate pornography. I hate this garbage. I hate people dressing in my... I hate it. I hate it. I hate... Don't, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I don't... And I'm definitely not going to put it before my eyes. I'm not going to willingly just sit down and say, Here, I'm going to put this thing that I know is a sin in front of my eyes. Here, I'm just going to commit adultery in my heart by putting this image in front of my eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Verse 4 says, A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. We need to make sure that we are guarding what comes into our minds and how we're spending our time. Now, if you do have a problem with looking at things that you ought not to be looking at, you need to put, make sure you're putting yourself in an environment where you're held a little bit more accountable for your actions. What do I mean? Let's, let's, get, let's get detailed about this. Okay, let's say you're married, right? You need to make sure that you're not creating opportunities where you're apart from your wife and you're alone and you're even capable of getting into this stuff, for one. That would be a good start. Another thing to do is just have an agreement. And if you know this might be a problem for you, especially if you know this might be a problem, you need to be able to talk to your spouse and be like, look, I don't want this to happen because I love you and I don't want to have this draw a wedge between us and, and have it so that, you know, there's software out there that can, that, can, that can make it so that you can't hide what you've done. You can't erase the things that you've done on your computer and that there's more accountability there. So that way, you're not thinking you're getting away with this stuff. Because having human accountability is helpful. Obviously, we need to just make sure we're accountable to God. But sometimes we can just put God out of our minds. And that's where we really get into trouble. When we think that, yeah, no one sees what I'm doing right now. And I think I'm just, oh, I'm... And, and you know what's... <sighs> getting into sins like that, you think you aren't causing harm or damage to anybody else. And you're so wrong. Espe you know, with men, it's usually the problem that with the with man. Let's be honest. With, with that type of a sin, it's, it's something that men are much more inclined to do. Your wife wants you to love her. And just like, I mean, think about your wife. Don't you want your wife loving you and loving you only? Do you want your spouse, your wife, or your, I mean, does it apply it both ways? Okay, men and women. Do you want your spouse looking at somebody else and looking at them in lust or looking at them in a way that in that nature that, that ought to only be directed towards you. When you look at those things and have, and have those types of thoughts or have that type, you know, you are betraying your wife in your heart. That's why he says you're committing adultery in your heart. It's a betrayal. And what that's going to cause you to do, whether you realize it or not, is to be bitter and despiteful against your wife without you even realizing it because your heart has become separated from her. If this is a problem in your head, you need to make sure as much as possible that that's not going to happen because that can, that can destroy marriages. It does destroy marriages. People getting, sit down and pay attention. I'm not going to tell you again. This type of sin destroys marriages. We need to make sure that we can, we can put that as far away from us as possible. Turn, if you would, to Numbers 32. And we need to keep this in mind as well. Numbers chapter 32. And again, this could be applied to any secret sin that you have where you think you're getting away with it. Some people might have an opportunity on the job to steal. 
right? They might have this opportunity where whatever, whatever the case may be, they're alone. They've got no one watching over their back. Maybe there's no security cameras, right? And maybe they figured out a way where, oh, yeah, they won't even notice this. And I could just steal a little bit here, a little bit there. I could just steal, and it's fine. And no one knows I'm doing it, and I'm getting a little bit extra because maybe I'm a little bit bitter that the boss isn't paying me enough, so I'm going to take it on my own. Look, that's thievery, that's stealing, and God hates it. God hates lying. God hates thieves. Now, you might think you're getting away with it. And from your boss, maybe you will, excuse me, maybe you will get away with it from, the, from someone else knowing. But like I mentioned earlier, God knows what's going on. And he is the just judge. He will make sure that things are righted that are when there's wrongs. He makes, makes sure that these things happen. You know, so, you know, false religions will call it karma. I don't believe in karma, but I do believe that, that, that what the Bible says about that whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. So when you're sowing sin and wickedness, when you do bad things, hey, it's going to come back around you. It's going to bite you, and it's going to be way worse than it was when you started doing it. In Numbers 32, verse 20, the Bible reads, And Moses said unto them, If ye will do this thing, if ye will go armed before the Lord to war, and will go all of you armed over Jordan before the Lord until he hath driven out his enemies from before him and the land be subdued before the Lord. Then afterward ye shall return and be guiltless before the Lord and before Israel and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. Now, just in context, as you understand what's going on, this is when the children of Israel were going to go into the promised land, but um, they right before they were going to cross the Jordan River, they, they get to the point and they defeat the uh, Og, the king of Bashan, and they, they defeat a couple of countries that wasn't in the promised land yet, but they, they wouldn't let them pass through their land, so they came out to fight with them. So they basically conquered them, and now they have this extra land that wasn't originally included in their promised land that God was giving them. So, you know, half the tribe of Manasseh and... Um, Reuben, they wanted, they wanted this land for themselves. They said, hey, look, this is a great land for our cattle. We want to have this land. And Moses is warning them. He's saying, okay, well, look, you, know, you can't just have this land and be like, okay, well, we have our inheritance. We're going to stick here. You guys all go and fight the battles because there was all the inhabitants of the land living where they were supposed to go and defeat them and conquer them in war and take over and take that land. So he's like, you need to go with your brethren. You need to go and be involved in these fights and in these battles before you can just sit back and take this land. So this is where we're at in Numbers 32. He's saying, okay, if you're going to do this, he says, you can have this land, that's fine. You can have this, no problem, but you need to go out, you need to be involved in fighting these wars, and then when, they're, when everybody has their inheritance, then you can come back home and, and inherit your land. And he, he warns them in verse 23, he says, but if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. He says, know this. Because do you think he's going to keep tabs on every single person that's supposed to go out and fight? I mean, how is he going to know if some soldiers end up going back home? Right? And they don't really stick around for these battles. He's not going to know that. But God knows that. You know, these people might think, oh yeah, I got away with it. You know, I don't want to fight in these wars. I already got my land. I'm going to go back to my family and my children and my land. And I'm going to get everything ready because I've already got my land. And they'll be fine without me, right? But he says, you know what? If you don't do that, he says, be sure your sin will find you out. And we need to be sure when we sin against God, God's not going to let you just get away with that. Your sin will find you out. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to see some more strong words about sinning willfully. Because this is one of the worst things that you can do. After you're saved, you know God's way. And once you start to learn, the, learn God's laws, learn what God has for us to do, when you sin presumptuously or willfully against the Lord. Think about the disrespect. I mean, think about my children. If my children do something wrong, but they don't really know it's wrong, you know, the first time they do it, do you think I'm really going to come down that hard on them when, when they did something wrong, but they didn't even realize it was wrong? I never really told them and said, hey, you know, don't do this. No. Now, they may be disciplined to, to warn them about doing that again, depending on what it is that they're doing, right? They, might, they may get a spanking or something, but when I, now when I tell them to do something or not to do something, and it's not like it's brand new, this is something they've known maybe for a couple years, 
and they know, hey, dad knows this is not allowed, this is not acceptable, I'm not supposed to do this, but then they just go and do it anyways. That is extremely disrespectful. It shows that you don't care what I say. And the discipline that's going to come as a result of that is going to be much more severe than just a mistake, right? Than just something, oh, I, you know, or, or even something that was, they get caught up and end up doing something, okay, I know it was wrong, but I, but I ended up doing this. No, when you just willfully say, I want to do this. I want to eat this candy. Dad said no. All, you know, I can't have this, but I just want it anyways. I'm just going to do it. That's going to bring a much worse punishment as a result. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. More strong words there. Now, I don't want to get too far into this because it's a little bit outside of the scope of the sermon. Some people think that this is proof that you could lose your salvation. I don't believe that for a second. I believe that once we are saved, we are saved eternally. We are saved forever. And, um, but what this is saying is that he's, he's relating this to Moses' law. He says, look, under Moses' law, when you despise the commandments, you are, killed, you are put to death under two or three witnesses. That was Moses' law. And he says... You know, obviously our salvation, we are freed from the law through Jesus Christ, but they also, they used to be able to, when you would sin in the Old Testament, you can bring a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice, as a way to get right with God. Now, it didn't, it didn't cleanse you from your sins, that did not bring you eternal salvation, but what it was is a way of getting right with God. Now, we all ought to be getting right with, I mean, if you sin... You don't have to worry about losing your salvation. Christ paid for all of that. But you do need to worry about repairing your relationship with God, so to speak, of, you know, the same way my children, they're always my children no matter what. Nothing is going to change the fact that they're born into my family, they're my children, and I love them. But if they just do me wrong, they're going to need to, to try to do something to repent, to say they're sorry, to, to come back, to try to repair the relationship now once they've already you know, despised me and despised my laws and what, and what I've told them to do. So what he's saying is, you know, in the Old Testament, you used to be able to bring a sacrifice. We don't have a sacrifice for sin anymore. We, we can't do that. Not, and there is nothing like that anymore in the New Testament. And he's saying, look, of how much, how much of a worse punishment do you think it's going to be? Because when you know you've got the Son of God, He's paid for your sins and you're just treating that as if it's nothing. When you just willfully go out and sin against God, you're saying, you know what? I know that Christ died on the cross for all of my sins but I'm going to do this anyways. It's, it's as if you're just at, just, just heap on more sins onto Christ for him to pay for it. It's just willfully just trotting underfoot the Son of Man, just stepping all over Christ when you're willfully sinning against God. He's saying, you know, we know that God says, vengeance belongeth unto me. God will repay what you do. God will bring that vengeance back upon you and he will punish you because, well, for one, because he loves you, but he wants you to get right and not to have such disrespect for his laws and his commandments. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We need to, there's another verse to, to memorize if you have problems with real major problems with secret sins, with sins that no one else knows about. Hey, remember, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God because as much as you think you're getting away with it, you're not. Being able to overcome looking at things you shouldn't be looking at. One verse I love a lot is Job 31.1. And this verse has helped me out a lot just in my growth. Uh, Job says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. So he made this promise, this covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? His thoughts on other women was linked to what he's looking at. 
And so he's saying, how am I even going to be thinking about someone else if I've already made a covenant with my eyes not to look at, at, at other women that way, you know, not to, not to be putting his eyes on that stuff, which is, I mean, and apply this all across the board. Apply this to what you look at on the internet. Apply this to what you look at when you go out. Apply this to, to your taking multiple glances at people, you know, instead of just saying, well, okay, I, I probably ought not to be looking at that. And when you make that kind of covenant and you could, you could have that understanding with yourself, if you, when you can make that type of decision in your life to just say, I am not going to look at these things because I don't want it to taint my heart and I don't want to be thinking things I should not be thinking. We need to understand that the hurt that you cause is going to be very deep because the moment, you know, your sin's going to find you out and as much as you think you're getting away with stuff, people always get caught. The sins are always going to be brought to light. They're always going to be made known. And the longer you're going, when it's not made known, that, that's the, how much worse it's going to be when that does come to light. When those secret sins are revealed, when it does finally come out, that is going to cause you shame and it's going to cause the people around you, the people that you love, a lot of hurt. More than you're thinking when you're indulging yourself. because And that's what all sin is based on selfishness. It's based on that, that personal lush, lust, that, that fleshly desire to want to feast your eyes on something or, or whatever. And, you know, get high, get drunk, what, whatever that, that fleshly appetite is, that's selfish. You're thinking about just gratifying yourself. You're not thinking about other people when you're in that moment. But we need to be focused on other people. And that's why I put so much emphasis on that in my preaching as well, where we put esteem others better than ourselves. When you spend your time focused on helping other people, you're not going to be getting yourself into these sins because you're going to be more concerned about, hey, what can I do to help others? What can I do to help this person out? What can I do to help that person out? And spending time doing something about it, then you're not going to be having the idle time to use to just feast in, on your own lusts and feast on your own appetites and do this type of thing. We need to be able to strive to, to keep our consciences clear. And when you're doing right, when you're doing good, there is not a better feeling than knowing that you have a clear conscience before God. Elizabeth, go back there and sit by mom right now. That feeling when, when your conscience is clear. When you know you haven't done anything wrong and you can just have a clear heart, a clear conscience and, and know that you're doing right, that is a great feeling. Now obviously I know that we're all sinners. But in Acts 24, we see here in verse 16, it says, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. He said, I'm always working, I'm exercising toward this to have this conscience that's void of offense so that I'm not worried about me breaking God's laws and doing this stuff. And, and like I said, look, I know that, that we have sin and I know that nobody is perfect. I'm not claiming to be perfect and I know for a fact nobody in this world is perfect or has ever been perfect besides Jesus Christ. But we can at least get to a level of uprightness, you know, within in God's eyes, where we don't just have to have this 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 conscience, you know, our conscience just bearing down on us, you know, knowing that hey, you're doing it. Like when you're willfully sinning against God, you you've got you ought to have your conscience just really coming down on you, saying, saying you you can't be doing this. This is wrong. Turn to Proverbs 28. It's the last place we're going to turn. We're going to be done. Uh, with the sermon, Proverbs 28. We need to be able to confess our sins to God and to forsake them. The longer you hold on to those sins, the worse it's going to be for you, the worse it's going to be for everybody around you. We need to get rid of it. We need to not let the, the wickedness and the evil cleave unto us. We need to cast it out. We need to hate it and get it out of our lives. Proverbs 28, verse 13 says, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. When you're hiding your sins up, when you're, when you're holding it in, and you're just, you know, he's saying, you're not going to prosper. You're not going to do well. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And that, you know, take comfort in that. Because God says, look, if you confess your sins and say, God, this is wrong. 
I've done wrong and I'm not going to do it again. That's what confessing and forsaking is. You're getting rid of it. God says he'll have mercy on you. He wants you to get to have, to have that type of a humble spirit that says, God, I'm sorry, and you repent, and God is long-suffering and full of forgiveness. And He will look at that. When you get your heart right with Him, He will extend that mercy. And, and you can take comfort in that, but you have to take that first step of saying, look, this has to stop. I need to get right with God. The Bible says in verse 14, Happy is the man that feareth always. Now, the world might look at that and be like, what? Wait, how can you be happy when you're in fear? Right? But if we have the proper fear of the Lord, we're going to be keeping ourselves from doing these sins that are going to cause unhappiness, that's going to cause sorrow, that's going to cause destruction in our lives. So when we have that proper fear, just to obey God, we will be happy. Happy is the man that feareth always, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. Don't harden your heart to God's word, to God's laws. They're perfect. They're right. Cleave unto them. Don't, don't let yourself make excuses for your sins and make justifications and, and, and try to, to put it off and, and harden your own heart to this, to God's word. Look, he wants you to get right with him. He'll be merciful until you just confess and forsake. Get that out of there. And, and there's nothing worse than having that guilty conscience eating at you. I've done things in my life and, and you just, I mean, that, that can stick with you for a long time. Just thinking, like, man, why did I do that? That was so stupid. I can't believe I did that. That's not like me. You know, whether it's causing damage to someone else's property knowingly and then not coming clean about it or whatever. You know, I mean, there's so many instances you could think of. Uh, at least I can. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're not as bad as, I, as I've been. But I can think of so many things where, where I've just been like, man, you know, in my conscience is bearing down on me, that guilt. But if we, can, if we can take actions and take steps to avoid these secrets and to avoid the, the temptation to even indulge in these types of things and, and, and plan out your days and the way that you spend your time in a way that there's no opportunity to get sucked into these things. And you make that covenant with your eyes and you, and you, do the, you, you put up these types of barriers for yourself then you'll be able to, to hopefully have that clear conscience. When you, when you can love God's Word and start doing what's right, you can, you can go through life and say, yes, you know, I know I've done wrong. I'm going to continue to confess my sins and forsake them. But, but overall, you know, I'm, I'm not just willfully just, just knowing this is wrong and doing it. And, and that's the place where we all need to be. And again, I, I mean, everybody has their own sins. I'll ne hopefully, I'll never know about them, right? I mean, you've got your sins. I don't want to know what your secret sins are, but let's all personally just, just take our own self-evaluation and make the changes that are necessary to just get rid of it and get that stuff out of our lives. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. Lord, um, help us to take heed and to, and to treat these warnings appropriately that you have laid out in your word and, and look at the strong language that you've used. And not just read over that, dear God, but, but to really take it to heart and to know how, how wicked some of these things are and that, that we wouldn't make justifications for our sins and our actions, but that we would just humble ourselves and get right with you, dear Lord. I pray for everybody in this room today that we could all, myself included, we could all just be able to, to come to you with all of our sins that we're aware of and bring them to you and confess them and forsake them, dear Lord. And I also pray that you would please just help us to know our secret faults, the ones that we don't know about, that you would bring that knowledge to, to our attention, that you would show us that, that you would shine the light on these things, that we can get those things right as well, dear Lord. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.